Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so uh, we'll welcome everybody in here, and I don't even know what camera to look at, but there's a camera out there. Welcome to everybody out there on the, the web as well. Um, so uh, so here we're here, this first class today, uh, it's gonna be Lightroom and Photoshop for landscape photographers. Landscape, outdoor, nature, a um, little bit of everything. And, uh, and so the, the idea behind this is, is we're gonna start off in Lightroom, we're gonna build, right? We'll build as we go. So we'll start off with a few photo examples, um, you know, just some of the basic stuff and, and just, you know, kind of work some of the sliders, add a little bit to it where we get into some of the brushes and some of the filters that we have, and then we'll jump over into Photoshop when we need to um, and kind of keep on building from there. Uh, if you would do me a huge favor, so we got, we got 10 a.m. Um, if you do me a huge favor, I will leave plenty of time for your questions. And throughout, I'll probably stop and take a couple of questions here and there, just hopefully as it, as it relates to what I was teaching there. But if you've just got a totally different question, totally off question related to something I'm not talking about here, I will leave plenty of time at the end to grab those questions. So if you would, kind of let me plow through some of my examples here, and, um, and then that way I'll, uh, I'll have enough time for your questions at the end. Cool? Yes. All right. That was a question. <laughs> All right, um, so uh, so let's go ahead here and get started. Um, I, you know, where it's necessary, I'll kind of give you a little bit of of was that it? Was that a hand? No. That okay. Was <laughs> I was like, that's a question. <laughs> um, let's uh, let's go ahead and dive in here. So, outdoor photography. I think when when we start to think about editing. Um, this is really where, to me, the biggest challenges are going to be typically shadows and highlights. If you think about, if you think about once, once we take that camera outdoors and we start to photograph nature and landscapes and wildlife and whatever it is, the, the one thing we really lose control over is the lighting. Okay, we can move ourselves around and we can try to position ourselves, but we're not really going to be lugging flashes around and photographing deer and all that stuff. Um, you know, you get to a big lake. I don't care if you have a flash. If there's a, a mountain that's a mile off in the distance, there's nothing you're going to do to to be able to change the lighting. So, what I usually try to do is I get it as close as I can in the camera. Um, things that I've learned over the years are I can I can boost my shadows really, really well. Um, believe it or not, there's so much information and in highlights. So if you look at this photo, I mean, I, I can move two sliders, and these are usually where I'll start for my landscape stuff. Shadows, highlights. I mean, seriously, like, it instantly changes the photo. So I think with our landscapes and, and our outdoor stuff, I think that's you know that's probably some of the biggest things that we can uh, we we can do here. Um, and guys, this is you know this is out of the camera raw file. Look, I'll, I'll hit reset. All right, out of the camera raw file. Boost the shadows. Pull back the highlights. All right. If I zoom in, for those of you wondering, yeah, well, if you open up the shadows, don't you get noise? Um, no, you know. They weren't, if you look at them, they weren't black. It's not like I took black and I started to open up those shadows. So there's a lot of leeway in there. All right, uh, from here, one of the other things that I do, and again, I'm gonna kind of go through my basics. I'll start to move through them faster as we go, just so I don't, I don't keep repeating myself. But one of the, the things that's kind of always been part of my, uh, part of my workflow um, are whites and blacks. So what I can do is, we have, a, we have the histogram, all right? The histogram, if you look over on this side, that's gonna be your white point, all right? And if you look over on this side, that's gonna be your black point. So we have the histogram, and we, we could adjust our whites and blacks and we could monitor that. I'm personally not a, a big histogram person because the only thing I really care about the histogram, do I have white? and do I have black? It's the only thing I care about it. The rest of it is irrelevant because it's gonna look different for every photo. There is no right histogram, okay? So the way that I do this is I hold down the option or alt key and I click on whites and you'll see everything 
goes black. And as I drag this to the right, I start to see a couple little white specks here, okay? Once I hit that, I know I've got a white point. I'm gonna go ahead, let me hide that panel on the left there too, it gives us some more room. So I got a white point. And then if I hold down Option or Alt again, and I click on blacks, and I drag that, you can start to see some little black areas appear. That means I have a black point, all right? So what does this do for me? Well, if I go and look at the histogram again, you'll see before there was a tiny little gap there, there's not now. So I've basically given myself that white point, I've given myself that black point. Um, does two things, it gives me contrast, but it also, it also gives me, that's the word I'm looking for, um, it gives me a little bit of consistency. All right. Just by moving whites and blacks, I get contrast. That's, that's kind of a gimme. If you think of a contrast slider, and if you ever notice, you usually see me skip the contrast slider. All right. um, what's contrast do? Contrast makes blacks blacker and whites whiter. So I get that with whites and blacks. But the other part is consistency. So where, where my screen is right now, this is my editing environment. Your screen may be near a window. Um, yours may be in a dark room, yours may be with a light overhead or what, everybody's screen's gonna be in a different place. And what'll happen is that's gonna affect how you, you start to look at your photos. Um, a white point and a black point is always gonna be consistent. I could open this photo on any one of your computers and it's always gonna be the same. So it gives me a little bit of consistency um, in how I edit my photos. In this day and age, that's about the best we can hope for, okay? Once this photo leaves my computer screen, and you, get, you guys may be all great, you may all calibrate your computer screens every week, and I don't think you do. <laughs> but let's just say all of you do. That is you know, a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of the percentage of people that are out there that are viewing photos. So it doesn't matter if you calibrate your screen, me and a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a percent of people will all see my photo the way that I intended. The rest of the world, there's nothing you can do about it. You know, the, the, people are looking at pho are their photos on their phones, they're looking on their tablet, they're looking on their computer screens. There, there's just, there's nothing you can do other than at least have a consistency to your work. And, um, and that way, you know, if, if if their screen is dark, they're gonna think all my photos are dark, or think all my photos are white, but it does give some degree of consistency in there. All right, so, uh, so that's a little bit about the, uh, the histogram up there. Uh, clarity, remember how I said contrast does blacks and whites? Blacks blacker, whites whiter? So what about everything in between? You know, if we're thinking all the tones of gray, that's where clarity comes in. Uh, you may have seen this if you used to use Nick. Uh, you may have seen it in some plugins out there. There's something called structure. Um, that's a, a very similar thing. So clarity basically gives you a contrast in those, uh, those middle areas there. So if you look at it, you start to see it change there. A couple things that I, I notice about clarity are it will tend to make things, it'll tend to make your, your brights a little bit brighter. And it tends to desaturate things a little bit. It tends to take a little bit of the saturation away if you look at, at this photo here. So it's one of those settings. I'm careful with it. You know, if I have a lot of detail in the photo, I'll do it. If it's a portrait, probably not. Um, you know, bricks and walls and, and things like that. It works really good. Wildlife, it usually works good on feathers and stuff, but just have to make sure you use it in, uh, in, in sparingly uh, doses. Vibrance. Usually uh, it'll boost colors, but it'll leave skin tones alone. Saturation boosts everything, okay? Saturation you gotta be careful with because it, uh, it, it can get radioactive pretty quick. Um, so if it's a landscape photo, I'm generally gonna use saturation though. But, and I, I can tell you, I rarely go above like 10, 12. It's, that's where it starts to get bad. All right, so a little bit of saturation there. Just to show you where we're at, Again, backslash key shows you the before, backslash key shows you the after. All right, from there, I don't do anything with the tone curve. Um, 
for me personally, the tone curve is kind of, it's one of those legacy tools kind of left in there for curve junkies from Photoshop. So if you, if you grew up with Photoshop and that's what you used all the time, um, you know, curves were a very powerful tool back then. But really, you know, our, our goal with curves was to, to kind of work with the whites, work with the blacks. You could access your midtones in here. Um, we've got sliders to do that. So if you're the kind of person that likes to maybe dig in a little bit more, the curve might be for you. Personally, I usually just use the sliders. Uh, let's see here, HSL. So hue, saturation, luminance. On this photo, you know, I think we're pretty well saturated. Um, you know, hue's gonna change the hue of the blues or whatever color I choose there. I can go to luminance sometimes on a landscape photo. Uh, if you go to the blues, if you go to the left on the luminance slider, you can kind of darken the sky a little bit. All right. Almost, almost as if you know you had a, a circular polarizer on and turned it a little bit too much. So we don't want to go crazy with it, but we can add a little bit there. Uh, let's see here. I'm not gonna. We won't do a black and white just yet. Split toning. Split toning lets you get a tint in your shadows or your highlights. I, I do that more with a black and white. So we'll look at an example later. Detail. Let's talk sharpening and uh, noise reduction. So sharpening. First thing I'll tell you about sharpening. It is, it is probably one of the things I get asked about the most. Um, and uh, it, the interesting part about sharpening is, is it's the thing that I spend the least amount of time on. Like I literally, like I'll, I'll take the photo, I'll sit here, I'll zoom in, I'll be like, huh, looks pretty sharp, okay. Um, you know, I'll, if there's a key area, if I want to make sure, you know, if I, I mean, so I'm trying to think of what a key part of this would be. We just look at the mountain. I mean, I'll take it, I'll take my mount slider, I'll crank it up to 100, I'll be like, okay, doesn't look bad, and I'm done. I, I, I honestly don't spend any more time on it. But I'll tell you a little bit about what I'm looking for. Um, and then, you know, we can talk a little bit about some of the, the questions that I get around it. What I'm looking for is that I just really don't introduce texture into the photo. So I will push the sliders basically almost as far as I can without introducing texture, right? What do I mean by texture? I mean, I don't wanna go over here and I don't wanna crank up my amount slider, maybe crank up my detail slider, and I don't know if you guys can see that. That's texture, okay? So I'm trying not to, to introduce that. I'm trying to add enough sharpening that basically, you know, sharpening finds the edges, gives a little bit more contrast to them. So your amount slider, think of that as the contrast slider. How much contrast is it gonna add to an edge? Uh, radius, you can usually leave that right around one. Um, if you have lots of tiny little details, you can go a little bit lower because what it does, if you think it finds an edge, and then how far outside that edge does it apply that sharpening? So you don't want to go too high on it because you get that halo, that halo-y kind of glow around your edges. Detail, you can get into some trouble with detail because what detail says is if you have it at zero, it's really just targeting the edges, the contrasty stuff. If you crank it up, it starts to look at everything. So what happened here? it starts to sharpen my, it starts to put that texture into the sky. If this were a portrait, what's gonna happen? It's gonna start to, to sharpen the skin tones and everything in there. So that's what we're trying to avoid. Um, so that's why I usually keep our detail down a little bit. If for some reason I get to a spot where I'm like, well, you know what, the detail and the amount look good, but there's still a little too much noise in the sky, you have masking, and that'll mask it away from smooth areas. So if you, if you keep an eye on the sky, see how it goes away? But it's staying, here, I'll toggle it on and off. And if you didn't know, there's a little toggle switch there. That's before, that's after. So it is sharpening the photo, you can see it there, but it's keeping it away from the sky. And if you wanna watch it happen, you can zoom into, uh, or uh, you could go over here, hold down your option or your alt key as you drag it, and you can see where it's hiding it from. When it's white, everything's being sharpened. Whatever turns black, that's where it's hiding it from. 
Uh, noise reduction, <sighs> landscapes, we're, we're not doing, we're typically on a tripod. So we're not doing too much noise reduction. Uh, I'll pull up a wildlife photo in a little while. We'll start, we'll talk a little bit more about noise reduction. But for your landscapes, um, usually we're gonna have our ISO set down pretty low because we're on a tripod and um, we're not gonna do too much there. Lens corrections, enable profile corrections. I'm almost always check that. And if you look at what it does, if you look at the edges, Kind of gets rid of a little bit of that vignette on the edge there. Okay, um, I get rid of it because in a second you're going to see that I'm going to add it back in. But it, it gets rid of the it gets rid of kind of the ugly vignette, that really dark corner. And that's tough to it's, it's tough to work with. It doesn't really help the photo, and it's tough to get rid of um, any other way. All right, so that's our lens corrections here. Transformation, we don't really have anything uh, anything that's that off axis here to worry about. And then we'll go down here. So remember how I said I got rid of the vignette? One of the things I do is I like to go in and add a vignette back. And what I'm looking for is just to darken the edges and kind of bring your focus and just kind of take the focus off the edge. Uh, you can see here I feather it quite a bit and I use a pretty large vignette because I just I want it to be very, very smooth. I, the, you should usually never see the vignette in most of the cases. Nobody should be able to look at the photo and be like, oh, that's a vignette, I can see it. So that's your goal on that, is that, that you can't tell that you vignetted it. Um, all right, so remember before we did, uh, if you want to see your before and after photo, you can hold down your backslash key. So backslash shows you the before and the after. And I think you guys, most of you will agree with me that really the magic to this photo, although it went through the settings, the magic to the photo was really done in the basic panel. That's, uh, that's gonna be where, where most of your stuff is done. All right, let's, uh, let's move on to next example here. So this, this photo for me, <clears throat> this is one of those ones that, um, you know, I, I think just it, it shines in what we can what we can do with the photo after the fact because you know getting filters out, trying to to do what we can to get the foreground brighter, the sky dark, all these different things. I think the photo doesn't look quite as as impressive as it was when I was standing there, and that really is my goal with with my landscape photography. Is I, I knew what it was like when I was there, and I want to bring that to everybody else. So what I'll usually do here is um, we'll head over, again, shadows and highlights. That's generally where I'm going to start. So I can open up my shadows. Um, I think we're, we're pretty good on the highlight side. There's nothing that's really too bright here. In fact, if anything, I'm then going to go to exposure. And exposures just make everything brighter, just make the whole photo brighter. So I'll generally, I'll go over here to exposure, maybe pull back on that shadow a little bit. So that's looking pretty good. Um, I'm gonna go grab my crop tool. And I'm kind of thinking at this right here is kind of a horizon line. So I'd, I'd straighten and rotate around till that looks straight. Uh, the other thing that I could do is grab the straighten tool and just click and drag right along. You'll see it'll straighten that like so. Um, let's see here. White balance. So as you open up your shadows, a lot of times what's gonna happen is your shadows are gonna be cooler. They're gonna have a colder type of a feeling. Um, I always use the example, you know, if you ever, you ever go watch uh, an outdoor sport um, where maybe the, the sun's kind of behind the stadium or behind something, um, and there's people in the shade and there's people in the sunlight, like next time you're out there, if you look at it, when you first glance over to the shade, sometimes it, it looks cold. Then if you look on the field and you see everybody in the sunlight. So the same thing happens is, is it gets kind of cold. It gets a cool feeling. So I'll usually go over here and increase my temperature slider. And that's going to warm everything up. All right. Um, go down here, whites and blacks, option or alt click on whites. Drag that till I get a little white point there. Option or alt click on blacks, drag that till I get a black point. 
couple things to think about when you're doing this is, like, I don't want to go there, okay? That's too far, especially if it turns all white. Because what's happening is I, I'm, I've now lost all detail in that area. I'm trying to think of the best way to say this. Don't, I don't want you to take that stuff too seriously. So if you're printing the photo, it matters a little bit more. It's kind of like sharpening, right? If you're not gonna, if you're not gonna print the photo, God, you're barely ever gonna see your sharpening on the screen. If you're not gonna, if you're not gonna print the photo, your noise reduction, you're barely ever gonna see your noise reduction on the screen. Same thing with some of the, the highlights that, that we really work to keep and not keep. Um, if you're not gonna print the photo, it's not as big of a deal. Because if it goes all white, when someone sees it on the screen, it's gonna look normal. But if I do push something to white, and I print the photo, what happens? It's generally not gonna lay down any ink in that area. And that's, that's where it could look a little bit off in the print. So you just wanna be careful with that. Um, you know, it, uh, your output does matter when you're doing this stuff. So you wanna keep that stuff in mind. And you know, how, how many people print on a regular basis? Just curious. So there you go. Like, I mean, a third of the room raised their hand. And, and I can tell you just from my experience in, in, in talking to crowds, a third of the room raised their hand, but if I went around and sat and talked to everybody, I, I bet you almost everybody really starts to stress out about sharpening and noise reduction and highlights and detail and all that stuff that really you're only ever gonna see inside of the print. So just something to think about. You know, Not every photo needs to be destined for print. Sometimes we just take a photo and we like it and we, we play with it and we, we share it or do something like that. It doesn't mean every photo is gonna be a big print on our wall. Okay, uh, let's see here. So we've got our whites, we've got our blacks, a uh, little bit of clarity. I think, I think this photo you know, has a lot, of, a lot of contrast to begin with here. A um, little bit of saturation. I, I mean, look at the yellows in the water. Like, I mean, if I go to 15, it's, it's overdone. You know, so a little bit goes a long way there. Uh, let's see here, you know, I'm thinking Creatively, I might crop in a little bit more on this one. I don't want to get too too close up here. Just trying to remove a little bit of that outside. There we go. Just trying to get that a little bit closer to this uh, left side over here. Uh, all right, moving on down the line, tone curve. HSL, you know, the, there's really not a color in the photo that I want to work with. Sharpening, we'll go ahead. We can, uh, remember, you got to be zoomed in to at least 100%. Uh, if you're not sure how to zoom, go over here to your navigator panel on the left side and you will see fit, fill, one to one is your 100%. And then this next one over here, you can actually control. You actually change it to whatever you want it to be just by picking from that list there. Uh, if you came from a Photoshop world, it's just the same shortcuts as Photoshop, command, control, plus or minus. So I can use the shortcuts too. All right, so let's uh, let's kind of look, take a look in our uh, our detail, our detaily areas here. So amount, again, I'll crank that up. What am I looking for? I'm looking for texture. All right. So if I go too far, you know, that's what over sharpened looks like. So we want to we we want I can't I can't give you a formula, but I can tell you what it looks like when you've gone too far. So I will push it as close as I can up until that point, though. So I think we're pretty close there. There's not really, it's, it's, it's not doing anything to the sky that we have to worry about, so not gonna worry about that. All right, I took this photo last week in Florida, by the way. We had this huge snowstorm. It was crazy. It's like, <laughs> came out of nowhere. It was, <laughs> um, the, this 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 was this was taken this was taken by now what I call the most photographed place on earth, which is Iceland. It's like I think you will all agree, and I, I think I think you guys are all probably equally dreading the hashtag Iceland that is sure to come up in the next couple of months here because it's like it seems like it, the the tourists the tourism it's become so accessible to get there. Um, it, it, I, I can't even tell you like you go to some of these places. 
and it was literally hundreds of people. You see these waterfalls that you think like, oh God, that looks like a quaint waterfall in Iceland off in a quaint little place that maybe I had to do a little hike to. Nope. It was a big parking lot that you drove up to and you shared that experience with you and 500 of your favorite tourists. <laughs> so, it, uh, it, now, I, I'm, I hope I'm not painting a bad, if you get the chance, because it's, 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 guys, I think it's faster to go, for you to go to Iceland here from JFK than it is to get over to Seattle. Because <laughs> the, the week that I went to Iceland, I was in Seattle earlier that week, and my flight from Seattle to, to Atlanta was longer. I actually flew through JFK, that JFK flight. It's like nothing. It was under five hours. So it's very accessible. Um, it's a great country. It's, everybody's so polite. It's so many people speak English. So I sound like I'm on the tourist board for Iceland, but neat place if you ever get the chance to go. Just understand that you'll be sharing it with many other people. All right, uh, let's see here, I digress. Um, enable profile corrections, so uh, we'll go ahead and turn that on. You can see here, works on the edges a little bit. Um, go down here to effects, and I will put my obligatory vignette around here. Just a little bit. If I were to finish this, or if I were to take it the, the next step, so something that we haven't done yet, um, these little filters up here open up huge possibilities for us. So I'm gonna go to the graduated filter. This is, uh, this is probably the closest one that kind of replaces something that we'd use in the camera, um, which is you know a graduated neutral density filter you put over the lens, darken the sky, use, they go from dark to clear. Um, you'd use it to darken the sky. So you noticed before when I did two things. I boosted the exposure of the photo. Remember when I did that? And then remember, I warmed the whole photo. I took the temperature slider and moved it to the right. That did two things to the sky. It made the sky a little bit brighter than I would care for. Um, and it also made it a little bit more yellow. All right. All of these different lighting conditions exist when we're outside. Our eyes just account for them. Your cameras, and when you get on the screen, they don't, right? That's why we have to, our shadows get cool, we can, we can make them warmer, but then we, we do that to the whole photo. So what I can do over here is take my grad filter, I can bring the exposure down, just bring that exposure slider. And by the way, this is a whole new set of sliders. I see this one all the time, like put this down in that little list of things that can go wrong in Lightroom that you might not know of. <laughs> but you'll want this list when they do. I'll see this all the time. Somebody, they'll, they'll, they'll accidentally click on the grad filter or even worse, you know, you'll hit your keyboard. I think the keyboard shortcut's like K or something. Um, and, and they'll be moving exposure and they'll be like, why isn't anything happening? And they got off Adobe, this is broken, nothing's happening. Look, I'm moving exposure. So just keep in mind, this area looks really, really similar to your basic panel which has its own set of sliders too, all right? So these sliders are just for any of the filters you're using there. <clears throat> so I'll bring the exposure slider down. I don't really know how much yet. And then, uh, and then I'll just click and drag and pull that down. And that's how, that's kind of the, the, the like wiping my computer screen. I'm thinking that's a spot, but it's actually a spot on the photo. Uh, we'll look at that in a second. So that's kind of the default way. You know, you can move it up and down. You know, this would be a soft grad. This would be a hard transition grad. So I can move that up and down, split that transition more. Um, if I put my cursor near the little point in the middle, I can rotate it. <laughs> Sorry. Back. And uh, let's see here. And then here's what's cool is now the sky's darker, but it's got a little bit more of a muddy look to it. So you can go to your temperature slider and bring back some blue. So now I can work on both of them. Like so. All right, so that's before and that's after. All right. And when you're done, just hit close. Uh, here's a little tip 
for you if you want to jot this one down. Uh, one of the things you'll notice is as I am working through the basic panel, notice when I click on the tone curve panel, the basic panel closes. So if you don't know about this little trick, if you right click on any of the panel names, so just right click on tone curve, um, there's something called solo mode. It's the worst name feature in Lightroom. <clears throat> Because you'd never look at it and be like, oh, solo mode is the single panel mode. But it's, uh, what it does is, is it makes it so here. Now it's off, right? So when I open up basic and I open up tone curve, basic state open, I open up split toning, detail, you get the idea. And by the end of the day, you know, you're going to spend half your day going like this, back and forth. But if you turn on, right click and turn on solo mode, when I open up a panel and I go to the next panel, it automatically closes the previous panel. So solo mode is really single panel mode in disguise, because there is no actual single panel mode. And then if you want a little gag, you have a friend that uses Lightroom, and you just get a couple minutes of access to their computer. <laughs> if you were to right click over here on any of the panels, see these little check boxes? So like for me, I, I actually, I don't do split toning a whole lot. And usually if I'm going to get that creative, it's because I'm converting to a black and white and most of the time I'm going to use a plugin. So I can turn split toning off. You see it disappeared. I can turn transform off. So what you could do is go through here and just right click and just turn them all off. <laughs> Or if you really want to mess with them, just leave one on, like camera calibration. <laughs> there we go. So it's a little trick you can play. Uh, let's go back here to show all. There we go. <clears throat> OK, so solo mode is on. So there's your, uh, there's your quick little tip there. Um, all right, so I think we're looking good. I might, you know, just looking at it, I might open up the exposure a little bit. Maybe a little bit of clarity here. It's just a little warmer. All right, so let's take a look. Hit the backslash key, before, after. Pretty cool stuff. All right, and I didn't get rid of the spot. See that little guy up there? <clears throat> you have a brush right next to the crop tool. And you can use your right and left bracket keys, or you can use the little size slider. And then just click, and it'll get rid of the spot. If you ever don't like where it chose to, to fix it from, um, you can just move, move it around. Like sometimes you'll click on if there's a lot of clouds in the sky, and it'll pick on a cloud to fix it. So if that ever does that, you can just move move that around. Um, and then I'll show you an example here, because this is, uh, this is one of those ones. So let's go ahead and turn that on. When you choose your spot removal tool up here, if you look down in this little toolbar, there's a little option called Visualize Spots. All right. Turn that on, and you move this little slider. You can see the spots. So, and you can actually fix them right here. Like, you don't have to leave this mode to work on them. So, I know they say cover your camera when you're changing lenses. Apparently, I like to sneeze in mine. <laughs> or I ate dinner over it. Something like I, I, got, I, I went on a photo shoot the other way. I don't know how my sensor got. My sensor was it's literally, I counted there. I, I must have done like 150 spots. I don't know how it got that bad. It was, it was so horrible. Anyway, though, but that's a, uh, it's, uh, that's a good one, especially if you are going to print. 
they're harder to see on your screen and they're harder to see when your, your photo's a little bit smaller. If you are gonna print, I can tell you, and, and you know, anybody that has printed probably already knows this, sadly, is there's nothing more frustrating than spending the time and energy and money and you get that print and you put it up on the wall and you walk up to it and you see like little stuff in the sky. Like it's just, it's very, very frustrating. So make sure you go through and, uh, and get rid of that stuff. And by the way, most people don't care. Most people that see your photo don't even see it because they don't like walk up to the wall like this. But photographers do. All right, let's see here. So uh, let's take a look. Let's move on to We're working on pretty weather. Here, let's, let's go to this one. This will be a good. We get to use a few tools in this one. <clears throat> All right. So again, shadows, highlights. I'll pull back on my highlights. Um, notice what, when I pull back on the highlights, see what happens to the mountain. So it's getting the sky, but it's also getting the mountain. So this is one of those times where I start to, what's the best way to say it? I start to think about what, how much do I care about this photo, okay? The easy thing is grab your highlights, pull them down. If I really like this photo, and I, and I think, I, I don't think I'm the only one that, that does this. Do you guys have different degrees of like in a photo? Doesn't mean you don't care about it, doesn't mean you don't want to edit it, doesn't you? Know, I, I think if you're in this class, like I think you, you actually kind of like editing a little bit. Like it's kind of therapeutic to sit down and craft the photo and everything. We don't want to do monotonous work, but I think some of the artistic work is fun. So I think about how much I like the photo. If I think, hey, you know what, I this is kind of neat, it's just, I just want to share it really quick or whatever, you know, it's it's for some, it's for some reason or, or purpose that, that I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. I'll just grab the shadows and highlights and be done. If I think that photo has that next level of usefulness to me, that's when I start to go into the mode of what other tricks do I have to work on the sky? And that's maybe when I'll start to think about the grad filter and even another feature you're gonna see here in a second. So things to keep in mind, if you see, if you see me use the highlight slider in one photo and then I do it a harder way in another photo, a lot of times that's the reason why. So, as I'm thinking through this, you know, I'm like, all right, I kind of like this photo. So I'm not just gonna grab the highlights and, and pull them down. Um, I think our shadows are actually looking pretty good here. Whites and blacks, option or alt click. We have a white point. Option or alt click, drag that to the left. Get a little bit of a black point. Um, let's see here, clarity. Again, just be careful with it. It does give you a nice little snap to everything, but you don't want to go too far. Uh, we can definitely warm this up. This was sunrise. I'm going to go grab my crop tool, and I'm going to use that little shoreline over here as kind of a, an anchor to, uh, to straighten from. It's not very off, but just a little bit. Um, so that's our basics. Again, tone curve. I don't really have anything. We could go, yeah, I can play around a little bit on the greens and the yellows. Make those a little bit brighter. Um, detail. So let's zoom in on our trees. Again, I mean, we're gonna push our sliders just enough to where I start to see a little bit of texture. Then pull back. So that's our detail. Again, lens correction, same thing, just enable that little profile checkbox there. And then effects. So let's hold off on our vignette till the end here because we're gonna do a couple more things to this. So the sky, we wanna make that darker. So I can go to my grad filter, same thing I did before, right? Bring the exposure down, click, drag, position it. And then maybe even use the highlights a little bit too. Kind of a combination of both. Because exposure is just gonna make it all darker where the highlights will bring back a little bit of detail on that mountaintop. 
So what, what's, the, what's the problem that I have here? Just like a grad filter and camera would have done, it, there's going to be a line, right? Well, something that we haven't seen yet so far, we just used the grad filter, is it's got a couple of different things. It's got a brush option, but a lot of times we can get away with just boosting the shadows. So if you think about, if you think about what it's doing, is we darkened, this is, this is before, this is after. We just darkened that tree area. Well, if I go over here and I open up the shadows, the sky isn't a shadow, so nothing's happening to the sky. So it actually just lets me boost that area up a little bit. All right. Now, if you need to, if you have, if you have something like, let's say, and it didn't really happen too bad here, but let's say this mountaintop started to get too dark. I'm gonna press Command Plus to zoom in. What we can do is we can go over to the brush tool. So I was, remember I was in the grad filter, but there's a brush option and that's different from the brush tool. The brush option lets me erase or add to the grad filter. So in this case, I'm gonna go down here and I'm gonna go into erase mode and now you can see it's got a little minus. And now what I'll do is I can erase it from the mountain. Now I don't want to because I think it brought back pretty good detail. But the other thing that I can do is maybe if I want to make it a little bit brighter, think of your flow as kind of like opacity in that maybe I just bring back a little bit. So I can go, basically, you know, think about it this way. I've got this graduated filter that I've darkened the whole sky. It obviously went over the trees, but it went over the mountain too. So now I can take a brush and erase away part of that area that went over the mountain. So it can definitely come in handy. It can be one of those things that, you know, we are this, this afternoon in our one o'clock, we're gonna talk about, it's called Photoshop for Lightroom users. We'll, dump in, we'll jump into Photoshop a couple of times here, but this is really like, Photoshop, all the different things we could use Photoshop for as a Lightroom user. But something like this could keep us from having to jump over to Photoshop a lot of times. All right, let's go down here. Let's, uh, oh, you know what? Go back to my grad filter. Make that a little bit more blue. And then I'm gonna go back here to basic and I think I'm gonna warm the photo a little bit more. Again, make that little, sometimes it's a little push and pull. Okay. And then we'll come down here to effects. Throw a little bit of a vignette on there. If I was being really picky, I'd probably go onto the reflection and uh, maybe make that a little bit darker. I uh, just I, I just take the grad filter, drag it up from the bottom instead of from the top there. But I think we're actually pretty close on this one here. Last little finishing touch is the brush. So we've seen the grad filter. We've seen you know we can darken the sky and do all those things. If I have a strong object in the photo that I want to draw attention to, I'll go and I'll grab the brush, and in this case I'll bring the exposure slider up. And then let's go down here and make my brush smaller. Command plus to zoom in. And then we can just go down here and paint. Right over there. Now I can make that a little bit brighter. And you can control it. You don't have to know. You don't have to know when you click on it how bright and dark you want to make it. But that to me, that to me is the next, the next level. The next level beyond just moving the sliders around and everything. Um, you know, I, I, 
I feel for our landscape photos, we, we get a lot of depth and dimension by being out there and experiencing it, and we see a lot of it. And I think when you get that very lifelike experience onto a two-dimensional screen, I think you lose something. I think you lose something from the photo. And I think that's our job to bring these places back to people. And then we take our, our, our graduated filters and we take our brushes and we add depth and dim dimension to the things we, we think are, are worth seeing in the photo, I guess is the best way to say it. You know, what, what we saw is most important. We were there, I was there, like I knew that log was there. Interesting side story about this. Anybody ever been out to Seattle, Mount Rainier area? So there's a place called Reflections Lake. And me being like the guy that's like, hey, you know what, everybody goes to Reflections Lake, I'm gonna go hike somewhere and take a picture of Mount Rainier. So I do this mile hike through the woods, I get to this lake, it literally doesn't have a place to stand on the shoreline. There's a reason why Reflections Lake is so popular. It's the best place to shoot from. This was not, so like I'm going through the bushes and trees and I get, I'm literally, I had to take my shoes off, I'm standing in the water, so I know that this big log is here because I was looking for foreground. Um, but I think, you know, because it's darker, I think sometimes that can get a little bit more lost in the photo, so just type, uh, kind of think of things like that. And if you go to Mount Rainier, just go to reflect, learn from my experience and just go to the, go to the place that's got the best view. Um, all righty, so uh, let's take a look here. We can go backslash key before and after. All right. I will ask a question of me for you. Matt, why are you always out of vignette on top of all your photos? I get that a lot. So I, put, I usually finish off with some type of a vignette because, again, you know, think, I think portrait photographers, whether you're indoors or outdoors, por portrait photographers are molding and shaping and moving and doing things with the light, right? That's their job. You know, you, a good portrait photographer, you know, if they're, they're shooting in a dark situation, you know, you ever watch, you know, I, I always, I mean, there's, there's so many pros out there, but I remember one of the things I always, I always learned from watching Joe McNally was, you know, Joe would take these really dark scenes and he'd light it so perfectly, and you'd look at the ground and there was no light, and then I'd look at somebody else's photo and it's like they'd have a flash shining down on somebody, but it's casting light all over the ground, you know? So we wanna mold and shape that light so that it's only, it's only on the stuff that we want. And so a good portrait photographer does that. Well, when we get outside, we don't have that control, right? Everything's gonna be bright. So what we kinda do with the vignette is we just, bring our focus in a little bit. You know, the edges of a photo are usually can kind of get a little bit distracting and whatnot. So that vignette just kind of calms down and just kind of pulls people in uh, into the photo a little bit. That's why I usually do it. So dehaze is, um, dehaze is one of those newer filters, new-ish. And <clears throat> the idea behind it if you go over here, it's gonna be in your effects panel. And this is for the CC versions of, of uh, Lightroom and Photoshop. Um, if you go over here into your effects panel, beneath the vignetting, you're gonna see all the way down here at the bottom is dehaze. So dehaze is, is great for, you know, kind of cutting through some haze, especially if you look a little bit hazy back there. In fact, I wanna see if I got a better example here. Hold on one second. Search. Let's go to everything, because I think I had an even hazier photo. Ah, I think I already, I think that might have been one I already dehazed. That's why I was, I was looking at them like, it doesn't really look hazy. Um, so here's, a, here's one that's definitely, you can see the haze more. And it happens a lot on mountains off in the distance and whatnot. So dehaze does a really good job of, of kind of cutting through that it's kind of contrast. It looks like a little bit of contrast and blacks um, kind of put together in there. Does a really nice job. Um, one of the, the downsides of dehaze is, is you can see here is if I go and I start to, to crank it up. If you've got a lot of color in the photo, it'll start to oversaturate, especially blue skies. So sometimes you'll want to go higher on this 
and the blue, the sky starts to really get too blue. So in that case, what you can do is go to your brush tool, and there's a dehaze slider inside your brush tool. So you can crank up your, uh, your dehaze slider here, and then just take your brush. I'll make it a little bit heavier for you. Just take your brush and paint it. All right. If you guys didn't know, I'll even paint a little bit there. Uh, little tricks, little tricks that I use for for some of this stuff is um, you'll notice I'm using a pretty large brush, and uh, you'll also notice if you look at my brush settings, you'll notice that the uh, the feather setting is pretty high. So while here, let's reset this. I don't mind it if the haze the dehazing spreads into the bottom a little bit. I don't think the bottom needed it as bad, but I don't mind if it spreads in. So just little tricks that I use is I use a large brush and I use a really high feather setting. So that way, as I swipe down along here, I'm getting a little bit of an, uh, the effect down over there, but I'm not getting the full effect down there. So that's why if you ever notice, sometimes I'll make my brush a little bit larger and I'll paint along the edges to blend it in with some of those edges. All right, and then as I get closer, I'll hit the left bracket key and I'll make my brush smaller and then I'll go and I'll paint on the edges. And if you didn't know, there's a little auto mask setting down here right at the very bottom. So if I turn that on, I can make my brush a little bit larger. I'll use the right bracket key for that. And as I paint, dehaze, see how it's not spreading over into the sky? The main reason is because I have that checkbox on and also see the little crosshair in the middle? I'm keeping that crosshair. Uh, and by the way, I see people in the back. You guys have a screen next to you too, if you want to take a look over there. I know sometimes it's hard to see up here. But you can see here, I, uh, as long as I keep that crosshair, it won't spread and bleed over into the sky. And if you want to see that in action, there's a little checkbox to show the overlay. But you can see it keeps it from going over there into the sky. So that's the dehaze slider. Uh, the, the, what, what I'm doing now with the brush is typically the way I'll use it most of the time. Very few times does it, the slider just do it for me. I usually have to go into the brush. And then the other thing is, is know when to use it. Um, I, I, I see a lot of people like a very atmospheric photo with a lot of fog and whatnot, and they'll crank up the dehaze slider. And to me, it's like, you know, atmosphere is great. If you can get fog and you can get that type of a look, um, I think I think it can be really good. I think you know dehaze is good in some of those conditions where you know it could be a cityscape or whatnot, and it starts to get a little bit, a little bit hazy. I've been working on uh, I've been working on pretty weather. Let's let's move to when the weather is not so pretty. So what can we do there? Well, I think first thing again, shadows, highlights. Um, in this case. This is actually a black sand beach, so I don't need to go this far with it because it's, it's supposed to be. I'm probably going to go further than it looked because um, the hard part about a black sand beach is, is most people don't see them, so it's like, the, why is the beach so dark? Um, so I, yeah, I kind of I always cheat my photos from this, this area and kind of went a little bit further with them. So kind of open up the shadows there. Uh, we can go over here to our crop tool. And then maybe just grab my straighten, drag along there. You can see it's got a little bit of a curvature to it. Um, if that bugs you right away, I've been doing this a little bit later in the workflow, but you could go straight down to your uh, lens corrections here and enable that profile correction, and it should take care of most of that. Um, back up here to basic. Whites and blacks, option or alt click. 
not gonna go, I'm not gonna push this all the way to the blacks, but I'll go until I get a couple little specks there. Let's go take the sky. We'll use our graduated filter on it and bring the exposure down. So this is where I have a little bit of fun. And that is, you know, if I'm gonna have, if I have a gray blah sky, I'm not gonna go crazy, like make it really dark. But if I have a blah sky, I'll pull it back and then I'll crank up some clarity in it too. So basically, just go with it. You know, if, if you didn't, if you weren't really lucky on the, the pretty sunrise or the pretty sunset, then go dramatic, you know, push it a little bit. So between pulling down your exposure, but not going too far, maybe even a little bit on the highlights, and then cranking up that clarity, you'll get a much more dramatic sky, like so. And that might be a little too much, so I'll pull back there. All right, uh, let's see here. We have a little spot. So let's go grab my spot removal brush. Click on that. And sadly, there are more. <laughs> they were hiding, but they're there. I'm not going to go get rid of all of them because you guys will want to shoot me, but I'll get rid of a couple of them. A um, little side note for you. When you bring down the exposure in the sky and when you add a lot of clarity to your sky, you're going to bring out spots even more. So what might have been a spot that kind of faded away into something, as you start to add those effects to it, it actually gets a little bit worse. Um, there's a little spot down here. Looks like, I don't know if that was a footprint or, it wasn't a footprint because it's like I almost put a fence around me. I'm like, give me five minutes, everybody stay away. Like, just give me five minutes, don't walk around me. Um, but you can, uh, it's, not just a, it's not just a spot removal tool. You can actually click and paint. Get rid of it that way. This is, uh, this is that ice beach, that iceberg beach uh, that you, see, you might see pictures of in Iceland. And if you could imagine, the day that I went, it's the only piece of ice there, I see pictures, there's literally a thousand of them. And the day that I went, there was one. <laughs> one. I know. Uh, yeah, so anyway. And it's big. I mean, it's like you think, like, I can move it. It's like, thing like this big. But yeah, there's one. So it's all about the tides and everything like that, and I just didn't, didn't time it right. Uh, let's see here. So let's go ahead and zoom in on this. Uh, we can go down here to detail. Again, I'm going to crank it up until there's texture. Then pull back a little bit. Um, I took my brush on this one, and I added some clarity to the brush. And then what I did is I just went over here and I just painted over the ice. And then I think I went and added some saturation to it, too. And what the saturation did is it gave it a little bit of blue. Because it's ice, I feel like it should be blue. <laughs> Maybe not, but that's how it felt. All right. And then come down here, hit that with uh, A little bit of a vignette there. So that was where we started. After. For after. Cool. So let's take a look at one of the things that we can do inside a Lightroom if we have a super, a super contrasty scene is we can merge these into an HDR, OK? Um, later on this afternoon in the one o'clock class, I'll, I'll cover a little bit more about getting into Photoshop and some layers. But if we can, if we can do this here, 
we could save ourselves some work. And Lightroom actually has a really good HDR tool. So if you look here, you know, the, the, and this is a great, a great type of a scene. If you're shooting into the sun, um, if you're indoors, those are going to be really contrasty scenes. You know, a lot of times you've seen we can do a lot with exposure and shadows, but sometimes there's just you can't do that much. So a super contrasty scene inside shooting into the sun. What I'll usually do is I'll take three versions of the photo. Okay, I do minus two, and then I'll do generally like what the camera will meter at, and then plus two. Then from there, we can go, we just shift click and select all of them. We go photo, photo merge, HDR. It's gonna merge everything together for us. As it's doing that here, I'm what, see how it says de-ghost? So here, let's see if we turn on, uh, there we go. If you turn on auto tone, I'm gonna turn it on, when, when I do this, I'm gonna turn it on, and, and I'll explain to you what happens if you leave it off. But when you turn it on, it's gonna give you, it's gonna you know, apply some automatic fixes here. What the de-ghosting does, God bless you. What the de-ghosting does is, is it gives you different versions of your water. So the water was moving, so if I switched from none, and I'll just go straight over to high, you're gonna see it's gonna pick a smoother version of the water because different versions existed in one of those three frames that I merged into this. It takes a long time, by the way. That's why I don't, that's why I don't go through all the options, because you can see here. It's really not very presenter friendly. I found it out the hard way. Come on. There we go. So you see how it took a different version? I, if, if you weren't paying attention in that split second, it did take a different version of the water. So if you got something moving down there or whatnot, um, you can experiment a little bit with the de-ghosting options. And sometimes it'll, you know, if you had a, a boat going across a lake, um, if you had a car, if you had a person walking across, it, it would, it, some of them will actually remove that. All right, so let's leave auto tone on and let's hit merge. What it's gonna do is it's gonna give you a new version of the photo here. It's gonna merge it together and give you one brand new version of the photo that basically has the tonal information of three shots. All that exposure information from those three photos in one shot. And it does it in just under 25 minutes. <laughs> so it's really not too bad. Come on, you can do it. I know you can. There we go. So there's our uh, there's our new HDR version down here. All it did when I picked Auto Tone, all it did was move the sliders for me. Right. So if I hit reset, that's what it would have been. It just moved the sliders for me. So I can go over here to my shadows. Look at the exposure. I can go all the way to black. Like I've got a huge amount of exposure information here. We can pull back on our highlights. You see, look at that, look at all the sky it's bringing back. <laughs> uh, throw a little bit of warmth in there. Optional, I'll click my whites and blacks. Um, one of the things that I would do to this, just kind of make my job a little bit easier, would be I don't want to boost the shadows anymore. I don't really even want to boost the exposure anymore. I kind of like everything back here. Uh, I could take the grad filter. And we've been using it to work on the sky, right? If, if I can help you with anything, it's to start to think about what you can do with these tools in, in different ways. So think about what the grad filter does is it, it kind of applies everything in a line. So if you look down here at the bottom of your photo and you see this line of an area that's too bright, too dark, too anything, I just use the grad filter with positive exposure instead of negative like we did before. 
and now I can control that area. Same filter, same concept of what we did in the sky. I'm just I'm doing it in a different place. I can feather it up so it kind of blends nicely. Um, maybe make that a little bit warmer too. I think clarity will be a good one for this photo. And then, of course, if you guys insist, a little bit of a vignette. So this is a tough one. It's a tough one to give you a before and after. I mean, that was the before and after of the HDR, right? But our before really, you know, or before is any one of three photos. It could have been that one, it could have been that one. So it's tough to give you a real before and after of that. All right, now, so I mentioned before, you know, we can, we can have Lightroom merge things for us and whatnot. Eventually the time's gonna come where we're gonna want to do this manually ourselves. We're gonna to want to merge two photos together in some way. Um, this is, you know, this class is kind of called, you know, Lightroom Photoshop for landscape photographers. Um, the way that I like to really utilize Photoshop is for things that I know are really difficult or that we can't do um, in the field. So one of those, uh, one of those examples would be Using a polarizer. So you ever use a uh, you ever you ever use a polarizer on a wide angle lens? Um, if you do, what can happen is you get something like that, right? So I don't know what this is. Probably sixteen to thirty-five, something like that. Uh, so if you throw a polarizer on that wide angle lens, you get something like that. Uh, I I don't personally use the polarizer a whole lot for the sky, right? It'll, it'll make your clouds a little bit more defined. It'll make your sky a little bit bluer sometimes. Not a bad thing. Those are things that if I wanted to make my sky a little bit bluer, I have a slider I could do that later on with. Um, and I see people get into more trouble than not with a polarizer. So I don't use it for, for that a lot, but what I do use it for is to remove glare. So here's that, here's that structure that's off in the distance. If I go take a look at that versus that. So here is the polarized version. Here's the non-polarized version. See the difference? That's kind of white, loses some color, desaturated. That's got a lot of nice color saturation on it. And to make that look like this, in Photoshop or Lightroom would be difficult. You know, I, I mean, I'd, I'd have to recolor. It's not just gonna be a saturation slider. So, so that's why I like to use a polarizer. And then if you look down here on the sand, the same thing. You know, we just have less glare, more color. So knowing these things, we can, we can start to think ahead of time. So I'm out there in the field. I know that this is gonna happen. I'm ready for it. My camera's on a tripod. I take two shots. I take that one without the polarizer. I left the polarizer on. I just turned it so it wasn't affecting um, the photo. And then I took that shot with the polarizer uh, turned up, you know, kind of obviously pretty high because you get that little dip in the sky there. So I get that little dip in the sky. I got the original one. So here's what we'll do. We are going to shift click and select both of them. I'm gonna go up here to photo, down here to edit. If I just edit inside of Photoshop, it's gonna place them both as separate documents into Photoshop. But if I go down here to open as layers in Photoshop, it will stack them on top of each other. So I'll do that option here. And so what's gonna happen is gonna give me one document with two layers stacked on top of each other. And there we go. So now I have, let's just call this polar 
polarized, non. So now I got two different layers there. So the bottom one's the polarized one, the top one is the non-polarized one. So what do I want to do here? I want to get the sky from the top one, and I want to keep everything else from the bottom version. So here's the way to, here's the way to attack this, because it's going to be different for every, every one of your photos. You want to make, on the top layer, you want to make a selection of what you want to keep. Think about it that way. I want to make a selection of whatever I want to keep on that layer. So in this example here, I want to keep the sky. So I'll go over here and I'll take my quick selection tool. I will paint all on the sky there. Zoom in. Uh, you see it's selected too much of that. So my quick selection tool is a brush. Works like every other brush in Photoshop. Right bracket key makes it bigger, left bracket key makes it smaller. And then you see right now I'm in add mode. It's got a little plus on it. So if I hold down the option or alt key, I can go into subtract mode. And subtract out those edges that went too far in. So now I got my selection. Now I'm going to go over here and I'm going to add a layer mask to this. Okay? The way to think of it is your layer mask, when you click on your layer mask, what's selected stays. What's not selected goes away. So see what happened? The sky stayed and everything else got cut out and it shows my layer underneath. So I'll do it one more time. All right, I got my selection. If you click on the layer mask icon, it's going to keep whatever's selected and it's going to hide whatever is not. So that's why if you look at that layer mask, see it's white and black there. And the nice part about it is just it's not a permanent change. I could always go back and I could, I could paint over a layer mask. I could do something to it. Um, I didn't erase these pixels away for good. So if you're trying to work non-destructively, um, that's a good thing to do. Okay? And then from there, so your workflow to go from Lightroom to Photoshop and back again, um, your workflow is going to be, you're in Photoshop, you just go to File, Save. You don't change the name, you don't have to change anything about it, just hit File, Save, close it. When you go back over here to Lightroom, you'll see now there's another copy of that file right here. And that's my new version of the photo. All right. Depending on how you work inside Lightroom, a lot of people use collections. You put your favorites in there. I would now take this and put this into the collection. This almost kind of, this almost kind of replaces my, my pick of that photo shoot, because now this is really the photo that I'm going to print, I'm going to share, I'm going to start to do things with. Uh, if I ever wanted to re-edit it in Photoshop, I could just go File, Edit In. <coughs> and uh, open this up into Photoshop. Now, it's going to ask us a question. Do you want to edit a copy with Lightroom adjustments? There's not really many times where you just want to edit a copy. <coughs> but the other one could be edit original. So the way to think of this would be, did you do anything to it in Lightroom after? Then you want to edit a copy with the adjustments. If you didn't do anything to it in Lightroom, then you can just edit the original. Because the difference is, is when I edit original, it'll open this up with the layers intact. But if I edit a copy and it pastes the Lightroom adjustments on top of it, it, it my layers will be gone. OK, it flattens it for me. All right. <coughs> Let's take a look here. Ooh, this is, a, this is a small one. This is a neat little trick for you, though. Um, so has anybody, oh man, I'm not going to be able to make it happen. Do you ever load your photos into Lightroom? And you're importing your photos. You double click on a photo. You jump over to your develop module. And you're looking at it, and it looks saturated and vibrant. And then it goes flat. All right. Raise your hand if it's happened, just so I know that I'm not the only one. OK, at least two of you. I uh, know. Um, so, 
so here's what's happening. I want to I want to give you a, a way around because the, one of the questions I get is is like why does it go flat? And I can explain to you why it goes flat. And then the the follow up is always, well, how do I stop it? And you really can't. So, but here's here's something that you can do. So the reason why it goes flat is because when you shoot in RAW, your your RAW your camera embeds a JPEG in it. And that's actually, when you shoot in RAW, you're actually still seeing on the back of the camera, you're still seeing the JPEG, which is why it always looks good, it's bright, it's saturated, it's contrasty, you know. Um, but, and honestly, anything on the back of your camera, you could take, pick, take a picture of a garbage can at a park, it looks good because it's small. So, um, but when you get it onto your computer screen, load it in the Lightroom, and then you watch all these things. They're bright, they're saturated, and they turn flat. And that's because at first, Lightroom is showing you the embedded JPEG. And then once you've decided, I'm going to go into the develop module and I want to edit this, it, it's got to go read the whole, all the raw information. And then it gets rid of that JPEG and it shows you the raw photo. You say, hey, I want to shoot in raw. I don't want settings applied to my photos. So here's what you can do. Um, set your camera on the, it doesn't even have to be on a tripod, but take a raw photo and then take a JPEG of the same scene, all right? Bring them into Lightroom, get them set up next to each other. So if you go to, where'd it go here? Oh, you go to your develop module, all right? Um, when you look on this little toolbar here, by the way, can I give you another keyboard shortcut that you will need one day? I can't promise it'll be today or tomorrow, but you will need this. You will look down here and this toolbar will be gone. <laughs> I can't explain why you will most likely have inadvertently hit the T key on your keyboard and it goes away. It's even been such a problem that when you hit it, Notice Adobe has even put something there that says press T to show the toolbar key again, to the toolbar again, because they know that this messes people up. <laughs> but I mean, maybe your cat walks across your keyboard, so you're not sitting there, which happens. <laughs> um, so anyway, it's the T key. If you're ever looking and you're like, where the heck is this? I know I've seen it in a video. I know somebody's talked about it. It's the T key. Like make this list of like things that can go wrong in Lightroom and then fixes, this, this should go on to your list. So that's the T key. All right, see this little option down here? It says RA, reference view. This came out in Lightroom last November-ish, last fall sometime. Um, it's called reference view. I don't use it a lot, but it, it does come in handy for some stuff. So we're gonna go and click on it, go into reference view. So what it says is drag a photo from the film strip to set the reference. Well, I am gonna take my JPEG and set my reference, okay? And then my other photo is my active photo. So now what happens is you can, you, the, the idea behind this is, is you tweak your active photo until it looks like the reference. So some people use this for stylization. You know, they see, they see a photo with a style that they like, excuse me, and so they, they take a photo and they can tweak things to get it to look like that photo. Well, in our, in our case here, it's pretty much going to be under camera calibration. When you shoot in RAW, these little profiles become available to you. If you shoot in JPEG, it's just going to say embedded because it's already been done. It's already been done in camera. But when you shoot in RAW, all these little profiles become available to you. So you can click through and see which one matches the one that you have over in your referenced. So I can tell you from experience as, as a landscape photographer, um, landscape and vivid are gonna be pretty darn close. I can't even see that much of a difference. But landscape, that's a good one for that. So now if you look, if I turn it on and off, you'll see that that's what's giving me that view, that, that look to the photo. So here's what's cool about it, is we can get out of reference view, and I can go over here to my left-hand side, and I can create myself a preset, 
turn on calibration and call it landscape profile. Landscape JPEG lookalike, whatever you want to call it. All right. Landscape profile. I'll save it in my user presets here. Hit create. And so now you can see here shows up right down there. Okay. Now, not bad, right? If I got, let's say I'm looking at, you know, a whole bunch of other photos over here, I could very easily uh, just go down here and click on them. Um, I could apply a preset to them. I could, you know, I could go over, if I'm in the develop module here, I could copy settings, I could paste. I've got ways to do it. But here's where it's neat, is if I go to file import when I'm bringing photos in, if you look over here on the right-hand side, under develop settings, I can go to my presets and I can choose that preset. So now as I bring my, my next photo shoot in, if it was a landscape photo shoot, then I can go in and I can just select that preset and it's gonna tag it to all those photos so I don't have to go and do it later. If you're a portrait photographer, do it for portraits. The portrait profile is actually, believe it or not, really good. It, it, does, uh, it renders the skin tone usually really nicely. So make one for your portraits too. But that's a nice easy way to do it without having to, to go and do it after the fact. All right. Oh, can I show you guys something? So I just got a hold of this. Anybody ever seen? It's, it, it's, it's not out out yet. It's pretty neat. So it's a keyboard. Here, let me, uh, I'm going to plug it in. It's called Loop Deck. Loop Deck. So let me see here. It's pretty neat. There we go. Um, it's basically a keyboard of your develop module. So I, I know it's going to be hard for you guys to see. I mean, at the top left, it's got undo, redo. That, that, that big knob is your uh, rotate crop tool. Um, it's got saturates. So it's got all your color, HSL colors here, and then saturation and luminance which means, you know, if I want to move the reds, but I want to do saturation, I hit reds. Look at my screen. Why is that better than doing it on the computer? I didn't say it's better. <laughs> <laughs> so why does anybody need this? Huh? Why do we need anything? Why do I need the seven camera bags in my closet? Because <laughs> I got tired of the six before. Exactly. Sometimes it's just fun. <laughs> so uh, anyway, I, I, I think everybody works a little bit differently. Um, I, I personally, I use a Wacom pen and tablet. And that's just because it doesn't necessarily, especially in Lightroom, it doesn't necessarily do anything different for me. It just feels better for editing. Um, I, we could argue, I mean, brushing, there are certain things you can do with the pen and tablet. I actually don't use it for a lot of those. I just like the feel of using and the control I get with the pen and the tablet. So, you know, some people, like, imagine you literally sit back at your desk, you can sit back and just, you know, you're moving slider here. Here, where's uh, my exposure? Exposure. You're kind of sitting back, you're just moving stuff around. Clarity. You know, I got to hand it to him at least for this, which is somebody has actually invented a peripheral for the computer for photographers. Like, it's gotten really boring out there for the computer itself. Like, the Wacom tablet is really the last thing, and that's been around forever. What's that? Wacom? Never heard of a Wacom tablet yet? Oh my God. W-A-C-O-M, they're so, they're, it's, it's a pen and a tablet. You hold a little pen, you got a pressure, it's pressure sensitive. So if you're brushing, if you're using a brush tool, the harder you press down, the more of the effect it lays down. The lighter you press, the less of the effect, which is, is kind of neat. Um, or you can do it like, you know, spots in the sky. If you get a bigger one or a smaller one, it'll adjust the size of the brush. It's pretty cool. But this is pretty neat. Like I say, I could see if you're sitting at a desk, 
and you're kind of just sitting back. You want to see your before and after. Hit the before, boom, boom. Vibrant saturation. Oh, I can zoom. Um, it's got star ratings on it too. So if you look down there, you can do your star ratings, your color labels. It's a gadget. <laughs> Uh, the price, I don't know offhand. What's that? No, 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 no. No, because I haven't, I haven't just, uh, it's, I think when you get a peripheral like that, it takes you a while to figure out if you like it or not. And that's why I would always suggest whenever you buy anything from that, I mean, this is also not paid advertising, but this is why I shop at Bean. It's because I can bring anything back, you know. I bought I brought microphones for to do recording at home, and I had them delivered. And you know what? I was coming up here. I live in Florida. I was coming up here, and I'm and I had to send them back. And I'm like, this is great. I don't even have to send them back now. Like I just brought them up with me in my bag yesterday. But I, I'd advise like whenever you buy, even you know, some people buy a Wacom pen and tablet and love it. Some people buy it and hate it. Buy it from a place you can send it back. So, but the, here's, here's one of the things I can tell you that, that they did right, though, is they made it more from a creative aspect. There's been other products that are similar to this that have come out, um, and it's been a little bit, to me, they've been a little bit too techy. The, these guys did it from much more of a creative aspect, I think, the way we would creatively kind of lay out a flow in there. Some of the other ones I've seen, there are so many keys, you could never figure out what they did you'd forget what they did because they had a limited space. So it's one of the things that I noticed about this that I liked. Um, but I'm still, I'm in that phase of, like when I bought my Wacom pen and tablet, it took me two weeks to like it. So I'm in that phase of trying to figure out, you know, how much, uh, how much can I use it? All right, uh, so we saw all that stuff. All right, so I'm about to wrap up. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, cover, I'm gonna cover the basics of a topic there's no way I could even cover this topic, you know, in the in this whole class if I did. But it's for landscape photographers. It's something that I hear a lot of questions about, and I can spend a few minutes and go over it with you guys, and hopefully give you enough ammo to figure out if you want to learn more about it. It's called luminosity masking. Okay, anybody heard of luminosity masking? So just better. This is one of those things that. It is it has resurfaced um, much more in the last few years. Um, I don't know the best way. Here's what I'm going to say. I'll start off by saying it is a technique. It's it's a workflow, and I think it's for people that like to tinker. So think about it this way. Um, I, and, and this is a true story. I have, I have friends that own boats, okay? I got one guy, he owns a boat. Whenever anything goes wrong, he goes to the dock and he's, he's taking stuff apart and he's fixing it and he's doing all this stuff. I got this other friend, it's like, you know, if the battery goes bad, he's like, uh-uh, somebody fix it, fix it, you know? He's, he's not a tanker. He doesn't like to tinker, he doesn't like to get in there, he doesn't like to change things, do things. He, he'd rather have somebody else do it. The other guy, he's like, he can't understand that. You know, he's like, I want to know my boat inside and out. The other guy's just like, I just want to use my boat. Um, so I think if you were to take that over to editing, there's some things, there's ways that we can draw, you know, some, some similarities there. Because there's a hundred different ways to edit a photo. There's nobody in here that hasn't seen all these tutorials out there of people that did stuff exactly different than I just did it right here. You know, my guess is, is you saw somebody that has sworn to you that curves is the only way to edit a photo, right? And I just told you, don't ever use curves. So there's, there's a lot of different ways to use this stuff. So here's the deal. I can show you enough of this. It, it gets so deep that there's no way to, to show you all of it. I could show you enough of this that I can at least kind of whet your appetite for it. So think of luminosity masking, what is it? Luminosity masking is, is getting a mask. And when I say mask, take that word mask and interpret it over to selection. That's really what they are. It's getting a selection of your highlights and your shadows 
or your luminance, and once you have a selection of your luminance, your, your brighter parts of the photo, you then, just by reversing it, have your darker parts of your photo, right? So you get your bright parts, and, you, and it's basically getting control of your highlights and your shadows. It's essentially what luminosity masking is, okay? So let's, uh, let's, I'm gonna open up a photo over here, and here, we can actually open up this one. So here we got, this, uh, we got this image over here inside of Lightroom. Go to my develop module. It's, it's basically, I took black, and I just did a, I did a tool in, in Photoshop that would just gradiate this in chunks over to white. So let's take this, I'm gonna edit this inside of, uh, edit this inside of Photoshop. So what I can do is I can use selection tools inside of Photoshop, and there's, there's a little trick. If we go to our channels panel, and, uh, and I command or control click on this RGB channel, I've essentially just selected the luminance of this photo. And we're gonna, we're gonna equate this to a real photo in a second. I've just selected the luminance of the photo. So now let's go to brightness and contrast, all right? If I wanna make the luminance brighter, which is the brighter parts of the photo, I drag this to the right. Notice it stops right around here, give or take. If I want to make the luminance or the brighter parts darker, I go over here, right? Cool. So I just, that's a luminosity mask. I just created a mask or selection of the luminosity of my photo, and now I can do things with it. Once I have that mask or selection, I can do something with it. I can add color to it, I can remove color from it, I can make it brighter, darker, sharpen it, add detail, whatever. So, uh, so let's press Command or Control J. All right, I'll hide that layer. Now, this is my mask over here, right? Well, if I go to Image Adjustments and Invert, what it does is that it flips that mask exactly the opposite. So what did I just do? That mask, or remember, we're equating mask with the word selection. That, that selection is now the opposite of the luminance, which is the darker stuff, okay? So let's go back over here to our adjustment layer. So now I have access on this layer to the darker stuff in my photo. So if I wanna take the darker stuff and make it brighter, I know it's tough to see, but you'll see this core bright area in the middle isn't really moving. It's really happening to the darker, darker stuff out there and some of the, the tones of gray. And if I wanna go the opposite and I wanna make the darker stuff darker, again, look at the center, it's not really messing with it. So now let's move that over here. Go to my channels panel, command or control click on the RGB, which gives me a selection of the luminance, and I'll go to brightness and contrast. So it, uh, you know, it almost looks like it's just a black and white version of the photo, but it really is a selection that targets the luminance. So now when I go to over here, if I want to, I have the luminance selected, the bright stuff. If I want to make the bright stuff darker, I go here. If I make the bright stuff brighter, I go here. Same thing we did before. Command or Control J. Go to my mask over here, I'll invert it. Adjustments, invert. And now, now I have access to my darker stuff, right? I want to make the darker stuff brighter, look. See the shadowy areas? Or if I want to make them darker, go the opposite. So in simplest terms, they get much more difficult, all right? And there's a lot of, there's more stuff you can do with them. In simplest terms, we just created two basic luminosity masks, right? One for, you know, one for the luminance 
And then once we have access to the luminance, we just reverse it. And now we got access to the dark stuff. Years ago, before Camera Raw, you know, Camera Raw was a plug-in to, but believe it or not, Camera Raw is just a plug-in to Photoshop. I think you even had to buy it in the beginning. Um, before Camera Raw, before all the cool fun tools now, before Lightroom, before all this stuff, when I opened up a photo and I started using Photoshop and I wanted to work on the shadows and the highlights, that's what I had to do. I had to make selections of the luminance and reverse them and do all these things to get access to all these different parts of the photo. That's where luminosity masks were created. Um, you know, like everybody says, film's coming back now. It's not really coming back, but I think it's fun to experiment. It's like people, luminosity mass is coming back. It's, it's not a better, different, whatever. It's just a different way to do something. So if what you just saw looks very, very similar to shadows and highlights, you are correct. It's just doing the work for us behind the scenes, all right? What you can't see, and I, I always wish I had a, when I used to, I worked for On One for like a year, um, and I got to play with some, um, I got to play with some uh, beta versions, and when I would move shadows and highlights, the developers hadn't, like, would, they would have the masks visible, and you could actually see the mask that the computer, that the software automatically built because that's, what it's hap that's what's happening. When I go to shadows over here, Lightroom has a mask in its memory of, of what it thinks are the shadows for this photo. And so you're just not, you're not exposed to it. But if you, you know, shadows, highlights, that's essentially what a luminosity mask is. So to bring it back to what I said before, there's the guy that likes to tinker and there's the guy that doesn't and kind of just wants to turn it on and turn it off and, and be done with it. There's nothing wrong with either side. There's, there's, there's place, places for all of us. So my only hope is, is I kind of give you guys some ammo. Maybe you're the person that likes to tinker. Sometimes I like to tinker a little bit more. If I really like the photo and I, I, you know, I want to do a little bit more with it, I know I'm going to print it big, I tinker a little bit more with it. So if you're the kind that likes to tinker, Luminosity masks are probably something that you might want to uh, you might want to look a little bit more into. The you're generally going to have to buy a panel system. Um, there's one uh, Tony Kuiper. Uh, I can get if you want if you're interested after afterwards. I can get you. We can look for links. But Tony Kuiper is one. Um, Jimmy McIntyre is another guy that makes them. Um, but they make these panel systems that go into Photoshop that build all these things for you. Um, and so you, most people that do luminosity masking get a, a panel system for it. So just a topic I hear a lot about. Um, can't do it justice in, in even two hours, but hopefully gives you a little bit of ammo on if it's something that you want to be interested in. Guys, everybody online, I didn't get to talk to you, but thank you. Guys, thank you so much. Thank you.